find a seat, we're going to get started. All right, well, again, good morning. I am so excited to be here in, at Bethy Shuren and able to see all of y'all and celebrate sisterhood in person. We had to miss it last year, but this year it's just great, and I'm so excited to have such a wonderful crowd and to have two wonderful honorees. So welcome to all, and um, I hope we have a great program for you. I'm Barbara Kozloff, and I am the co-president of the Bethy Shuren Sisterhood. And um, like I said, it's just so good to have all of y'all here. I know there's some people watching us on the live stream, and we're glad to have you join us also. Um, this year, we've planned a wonderful program, we think, as we honor two of the most extraordinary women who have been involved in sisterhood throughout the years. Their commitment to the congregation and to sisterhood and to the community, are, their commitment is beyond compare. Now, each year, Tor Fund campaign expresses sisterhood's continued commitment to perpetuate and strengthen conservative Judaism throughout the world. This campaign ensures our legacy for future generations by providing necessary funds to the wonderful institutions that educate our future rabbis, cantors, teachers, administrators, social workers, and lay leaders. In particular, we support the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies at American U Jewish University in Los Angeles, the Schechter Institute of Jewish Studies in Jerusalem, the Seminario Rabbinico Latinoamericano in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and also the Zacharias Frankel College in Potsdam, Germany. In a few minutes, Rabbi Strauss will tell you more about the Tor Fund campaign and the institutions it supports and also some of his experiences. I will also share some words from Mae Levitin, our Women's League Regional Tor Fund Coordinator. On this day, we recognize and offer congratulations to this year's recipients of the Martha Lee Stein Woman of Achievement Award, Marsha Abramson and Vicki Richker. Both have been Both have been members and dedicated leaders in sisterhood for many years. They have given their time, their talents, and their voices to Congregation Bethy Shuren and the community. I cannot think of two more deserving women. Marcia Abramson is a native Houstonian, as well as the daughter of two native Houstonians, Ray and Buddy Gerson, who are here with us today. So welcome, Ray and Buddy. Marcia is a longtime member of Beth Yashurin, dating back to her days in Beth Hayelid. And in 1969, she was part of the group of high school students supported by Beth Yashurin, who participated in the inaugural pilgrimage trip to Israel. And I congratulate her on that because I was a recipient of Beth Yashurin support some years after. So she got the ball rolling and she was a pioneer in the pilgrimage program. Marcia has been involved in sisterhood and the congregation for many years and has assumed many leadership roles and positions. One of her passions is social action. And for the past 15 years, she has co-chaired the Search Sack Lunch Program. Um, and in recent years, we added on to that, and it also includes um, snack packs for kids' meals. Marcia not only orchestrates the monthly assembly of these snack packs and lunches, but she coordinates ordering the needed supplies. She sets up the pro um, packaging process. She solicits the volunteer. During COVID, she made sure all protocols were kept. Note, we didn't have too many, but we always had enough. And then she delivers these snack packs and meals to the recipients. Um, I am in awe of Marcia's ability to pull it all together month after month with such grace and efficiency. Marcia is truly a woman of achievement and I am so pleased to have an opportunity to honor her with her family who are here with us in attendance today. So congratulations, Marcia. It is an absolute pleasure to honor Vicki Richker as a woman of achievement also. Vicki is co-chair of Sisterhood along with me, and she is our Sisterhood Ever Ready Bunny. She just keeps going and going and going. I can't keep up with her. And she also doesn't know the meaning of the word no. When they ask her to do something, she does it. And when she asks you to do something, she won't take no for an answer. So she is the ultimate leader of sisterhood. Um, her enthusiasm is infectious. She is dedicated to Beth Yashurin and sisterhood 
and it is evident in her work, commitment, and leadership. I am so fortunate to have Vicki as my sisterhood co-president and my good friend. Some days she's literally the first person I talk to in the morning and the last person I talk to at night, <laughs> except my husband. Um, we've had good times together and we've worked hard together, but her, her love of sisterhood and her love of synagogue are just so evident. Um, she, again, I said she has abundant energy and she is always ready to roll up her sleeves and get things done. She approaches each task with a very positive attitude and a can-do spirit. For me, she is an inspiration. So I'm thrilled today to honor Vicki. I also want to welcome her daughter, Elizabeth, who came from Florida to join us today. And then I wouldn't be able to finish my speech without thanking Michael. He's probably co-president number three. He is always there to help us out and support anything we need. And I want to thank you, Michael, for sharing Vicki with all of us. We are also delighted today to welcome Ellen Leventhal, a local educator and author of several acclaimed children's books, as our guest speaker. She's also my neighbor, and I love her. She, um, Ellen may hail from New York, but in our mind, she is ours in Texas. She moved to Houston in 1983, and Ellen and her husband Steve raised their two boys, and to be honest, she is a Houstonian and a Texan through and through. She's a beloved teacher, mentor, and writer, and we look forward to her address as she talks about her experiences, her writing career, her recent book, A Flood of Kindness, and her newest book, Debbie's Song. And I just want to mention Ellen's books will be available. Some of them will be available for sale or for order today after the program, and some of the proceeds will go to the tour fund and some will go to the food bank. So thank you, Ellen, for your generosity. Now... Now I'd like to also give a big thanks to all the Tor Fund guardians and benefactors who graciously contributed this year to the Tor Fund. Each year, the Beth Sharon Sisterhood is one of the largest sisterhood donors to the Women's League for Conservative Judaism Tor Fund, something I am very proud of. So thank all of y'all for donating. <laughs> An extra Tadara Ba goes to Jennifer Rosenswide, who assisted us with all aspects of this program and luncheon today. Jennifer creates the magic that brings it all together. Thanks also go to Ashley Mills and Abby Rotenberg for their continued help and support. And many thanks go to Andy Berger, Eileen Pettigrew, Marco Alvarado, Chef Kevin Flores, and to all the Bethy Shuren staff for your assistance. We couldn't do it without you. It takes a village, and we truly appreciate it. We also welcome and extend our sincere gratitude to the entire Stein family, many who are sitting here today, for their um, establishing the Martha Lee Stein Woman of Achievement Award. Each year, they honor their, the memory of their beloved mother, Martha Lee, and they provide this award for some of our extraordinary sisterhood members who show a love of Judaism and a passion for giving. Thank you for your continuous support over these past 29 years. We really do appreciate it and look forward to perpetuating this award many years into the future. Today, we are fortunate to have several past recipients of the Martha Lee Stein Woman of Achievement Award in attendance. Many of you are sitting here today in front of us. So I would like all past recipients who are here to please rise and let us acknowledge you for your contributions in the past and continued. Our Torah Fund theme this year is Be'echad, which means together. We could not think of a better theme for this program, as together we have all worked to support the synagogue and the community. The past year has been very trying on all of us, but together we have worked through the challenges and together we are moving forward. Together, regardless of the situation, Marsha and Vicki have continued to volunteer and provide their assistance in multiple capacities to support sisterhood and to support the synagogue and the Houston community. Marsha and Vicki are true women of achievement and both have exhibited acts of loving kindness, dedication, and leadership. Thank you all today for being here with us and for watching on live stream for donating to the Torah Fund and celebrating our truly special sisterhood honorees. Now, before I introduce Rabbi Strauss, I would like to read a message from our regional Torah Fund coordinator, 
May Levitin. She could not be here, but she asked me to read this to you, so um, here, here it goes. Be a chad, coming together. That is what being a member of Torah Fund means to me. Through our sisterhoods, we come together to create scholarship, educate, help promote our Jewish future. Whether they are rabbis, cantors, or others that teach our children and anyone else Judaism, these are the professionals that we so desperately need. The Torah Fund campaign of Women's League of Conservative Judaism benefits these conservative Masorti institutions of higher learning. And I mentioned before the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies, Los Angeles, the Schechter Institute of Jerusalem, the Seminaria Rabbinico Latinoamericano in Buenos Aires, and the Zacharias Frankel College in Potsdam, Germany. Supporting the Torah Fund is leaving a proud legacy to our children and their children. By helping these men and women achieve their goals, we are taking the lead, a very active role in carrying on our Jewish laws, holidays, and traditions to the next generation. And speaking of leveraging and leaving a le legacy, now the Torah Fund has a way to do this. The program is called the Torah Fund Legacy Fund. Whether you donate to the Legacy Fund now or bequeath these funds to the Torah Fund Legacy in your will, you can be assured that the money in this fund will ensure the long-term future of Jewish education. Torah Fund support will be a part of our community's resources long into the future. Our heritage, who we are, will not be forgotten. The money will be divided among the institution that Torah Fund supports at the time your gift is received. Currently, these funds are used to help sustain institutions that we mentioned above, I mentioned and may mention. To quote our past national president, Corey Schneider, she said, I believe the most single important thing I can do to change the world after I am gone is to help ensure that high quality education is available to the future leaders of the Jewish world. So May says, I am grateful for the Torah Fund for helping to educate the rabbis and other scholars who have taught me so much about my heritage, the laws of Judaism, and the holidays. We challenge everyone today to truly understand how supporting Torah Fund is a true gift for our children now and for every generation after. Thank you. And now, I would like to call Rabbi Strauss to come up and say a few words to all of us. Thank you, Thank you Barbara. It's great to see everyone. It's wonderful to be back in person. This week's Torah portion by Yishlak has a very interesting lesson for us. What finally brings the brothers back together, Jacob and Esau? Esau, understandably, is very upset with his brother Jacob. He's stolen his birthright and blessing. And after 20 years, he finally has an opportunity to bring revenge upon his brother Jacob. And yet, in the end, he doesn't. Why doesn't he? And the rabbis offer many answers, but one of the ones I like the best is that Esau decides not to take revenge on his brother Jacob because he sees him in person. Just the two of them, eye to eye, and in person, he can't take that revenge. All that hatred he had inside, all that anger dissipates, goes away. And he embraces his brother and he kisses them and they're reunited together as brothers again. And I mention this lesson because the two women that we honor today in so many ways have brought all of us together and so many people in our community together over the years through their volunteering, through their dedication and support and commitment, through their passion and love of Beth Yashern, Jewish community, and Jewish life in Houston, they have brought countless members of the Jewish community together here and throughout the city, year after year, program after program, service after service. Marsha Abramson and Vicki Richgear are two types of members, types of members that a rabbi can only dream about. When I was in rabbinical school, which now it's hard to believe it's been over 20 years ago, our professors would often talk about the type of memories you hope you'll have and the type of memories you hope you can create. And the number one thing they always said to us is hope you can cultivate members, work to create members, then encourage other members to come with them, that attract other people the work passionately day and night to encourage their friends, strangers, 
other members, whoever they are, fellow Jews, to join them volunteering, to join them in a service, to join them in a program. As a rabbinical student, I could only dream about having members like Vicki Richker and Marsha Abramson. How blessed we are at Beth Yashern to again honor two people like Vicki and Marsha that over the years have continued to bring us all together and will continue to do so year after year in the years ahead. Yesha Koch on a job well done, sisterhood for all the sisterhood does for our community. Mazel tov to the families, and it's great, it's great to see everyone here together in person. Thank you, everyone. In a minute, we are going to continue our program and let our honorees speak. But before we go on, I would like to recognize today all our guardians and benefactors who contributed a higher level to the Torah Fund. Um, each of you get a pen, and I have all your pens with me, which was a little bit of a supply chain issue, but I got them. So, but I'm, I won't waste time handing them out now, but I do want to recognize all of our uh, guardians and benefactors. So, Rona and Bruce Kress. Kelly Cohen Fine, Marcia Schooler, Andrea Stein, and Judy Sively. They are our <laughs> guardian contributors. Our benefactors are Marcia Abramson, Susan Baum, Linda Berger, Barbara Coleman, uh, Cantor Diane Dorf, and Rabbi Steve Morgan, Haley Feldman, Marjorie Fields, Sandra Finkelman, Sheila Franklin, Barbara Golub, Marilyn Hoffman, Lily Hurwitz, Sharon Kammerman, Barbara Kozloff, Marty Kunick, Anita Mattis, Carol Musher, Vicki and Michael Richker, Karen Robinson, Marcy Rosen, Marlene Rosenthal, Hedy, um, Hava Rothman, Toby Siegel, Jan Schaas, Annette Sondock, Paula Stein, Robin Stein, Lisa Strauss, Bonnie Winograd, Judy Yambra, and Diane Zwieback. Thank you all. We've, contributed, we've collected a lot so far, and we, again, will be one of the leaders in the conservative movement donating to the Torah Fund. So thank you. <laughs> so now I would like to call Marcia Schooler to come up and say a little bit about the Martha Lee Stein Award, and then we'll introduce our honorees. Good morning. As the oldest of Martha Lee and Albert Stein's four children, I want to extend my heartfelt thanks from our entire family to all of the women of Beth Yashurin Sisterhood for continuing to give us the privilege of honoring our beloved mother, Martha Lee Stein, every year at the Torah Fund Luncheon. I would like to introduce the members of our family who are here today. My husband, Lonnie Schooler, and my brother and sister-in-law, Rick and Paula Stein. Dad thoroughly enjoyed attending every Torah Fund program and luncheon until he passed away almost five years ago. Thank you very much, Barbara and Vicki, for all of the time and energy you have devoted to making this Torah Fund program special. Mazel tov to Marsha and Vicki, very dedicated and deserving sisterhood members whose names now join a truly remarkable group of women who are recipients of the Martha Lee Stein Woman of Achievement Award. This award recognizes outstanding Beth Yashurin Sisterhood members who actively participate in organizing and planning its pro programs, devoting many hours each year to a variety of sisterhood committees and sisterhood board, as well as to other Jewish community activities. When mom and dad married in 1949 and began having children in 1951, they joined Beth Yashurin and mom joined sisterhood. Sisterhood became an important part of her life for its meetings and programs fulfilled her need for continuing Jewish education, new friends, and involvement in the synagogue. Mom was an involved member of our sisterhood for many years. She always looked forward to sisterhood's monthly meetings and programs. The Passover workshop, the mother-daughter luncheon, and donor luncheons were some of her favorites. Mom loved bringing her daughters and daughters-in-law to sisterhood programs and would be thrilled to see the devoted young leaders of sisterhood today. She formed deep and lifelong friendships with other sisterhood members throughout the years. 
One of her closest friends was Ray Gerson, who is Marcia Abramson's mother. The Gerson children and Stein children grew up together, and I have many fond memories of the time we spent with Ray, Buddy, Marcia, Cindy, and Steve. Thank you again to Sisterhood for giving our family this meaningful opportunity to honor outstanding Jewish women with the annual Martha Lee Stein Woman of Achievement Award. Although neither mom nor dad is physically here today, we are deeply touched that mom's name and spirit live on in this way. Thank you. Okay, and now I would like to call up Cindy Abrams, who will introduce her sister, Marcia, as we award her with the Martha Lee Stein Woman of Achievement Award. Thank you to Bethy Sheeran's sisterhood for this lovely event and to my sister Marcia for asking me to say a few words. Mazel tov to you, Vicki, on receiving the Martha Lee Stein Woman of Achievement Award today. Your many contributions to Bethy Shuren and to sisterhood make you very deserving. Growing up, our brother would tease Marcia, singing, All I want is a room somewhere far away from Marcia Claire. That was my, sis my brother. I have never felt that way. I have always looked up to Marcia from an early age, wanting to be around her from sharing a room, her driving me around when she was 15 years old with her license, and going to visit you at her at college, I have many memories of my big sister as I grew up. As we matured into adulthood, though, I realized how lucky I am to have a sister who is also my friend. Yes, I still look to her for advice as a sister, and her influence on me is obvious but the sharing of parenting and now grandparenting experiences and all the holidays and occasions we enjoy have enriched me and my family. Marsha has influenced me to become more politically and socially aware and involved, and I know that if we are both in town, we will be at the Women's March cheering together. Fortunate also to have the non-event times of visiting, taking walks, and in the past year, many backyard visits. Lucky us, we come from a line of strong women who have always cared more for the mission than the recognition. Our grandmother, Frieda Steinberg, shared that dur during Israel's war for independence, they donated guns from their pawn shop to help the young Israeli army. Our mother, Ray Gerson, has been a volunteer at MD Anderson for several decades and touched many, as pa many patients as part, as part of the Jewish Family Service chaplaincy. Marsha's big heart in leading social action projects has impacted so many. The community of Thursday volunteers has grown into a supportive and devoted group that thrive under her leadership. The beneficiaries at Search and Kids Meal may not know her name, but their lives are uplifted by Marsha's actions. Her involvement with so many worthwhile endeavors include Bethy Shuren's Gathering Place, Reynolds Elementary, Tutoring, Hadassah, and more. When Marsha volunteers for something, she puts extra energy and time into it. She participates in fun runs and goes the extra mile and volunteers for packet pickup beforehand. To prepare for tutoring both on Zoom last year and in person now, she has gone to the library and consulted with Leslie, her daughter, who is a teacher, to bring the best to the students. During Hanukkah each year, she and her grandchildren have a mitzvah night and put together bags to give to the homeless. Aunt Martha and Uncle Albert Stein were very close friends of my parents. Growing up, our family shared lots of fun times. My memories of Aunt Martha include silly and playful ones when I would play with Ronnie at their home in Glen Meadow. She also had a powerful sense of accomplishment that was evident to me even at an early age. Aunt Martha's passing in 1991 left a big void for so many, including the Gerson family. Martha Lee and the Steins were like family to us and Marcia receiving this award in her name makes this honor even more special and significant. So on behalf of our family and Bethy Shuren's sisterhood, I am happy to introduce my sister, Marcia Abramson, 2020, 2021 recipient of the Martha Lee Stein Women of Achievement Award.
I hope I can fully express to Sisterhood, the congregation, and to the Stein family how honored I am to be chosen for this award. Becky Sharon has been a part of my life for all of my life. More than a place to celebrate big milestone events, my connection and involvement here have been a constant for me throughout the years. This synagogue is like another home, and this congregation is like extended family. Being a member of Beth Yashurin has given me uh, opportunities and responsibilities, and I am grateful for both. I am truly honored to be given recognition for efforts that I have really enjoyed and feel good about doing for and with my fellow congregants. So those of you who know me well will not be surprised to learn that in preparing for this speech, I first did some research. Not too much, but I found on myjewishlearning.com an article titled American Synagogue Sisterhoods. And I learned that about a century ago, 1910s, 1920s, American Jewish leaders were extremely concerned about growing Jewish apathy and assimilation into American culture. And it said, looking to preserve a Jewish identity that could exist in harmony with American ideals, they turned to Jewish women for help. It actually said they turned to Jewish women for salvation. And they founded our synagogue and temple sisterhoods. In response, sisterhoods, then and ever since, have served and strengthened their congregations, their respective denominations, their communities, and Judaism as a whole in ways too numerous to list. Even as times have changed and women now have few to no limits on our place in the synagogue, sisterhoods continue to be a place we can gather together as Jewish women and strengthen the bonds that connect us. As the article goes on to say, even the word sisterhood indicates a relationship that we strive for among ourselves, a closeness like sisters, a familiar and familial feeling. As those leaders, all men, understood over a century ago, there is value and power in our sisterhood. I am so honored to be included among the strong and devoted women who have received this award before me and among all the women who care deeply about our synagogue, our community, and Judaism. I want to give a huge thanks to Barbara and Vicki for this wonderful event and for everything the two of you have done as sisterhood presidents. These have been such difficult times for everyone, especially for our leaders, and we are all indebted to you both for keeping things going through the pandemic and making sure sisterhood fulfills all of its commitments to the synagogue and conservative Judaism. And I want to give a special, very heartfelt congratulations to Vicki. So about 15 years ago, as chair of the Social Action Committee, I went downtown and met with the people at Search about community service options to bring to Beth Yashurin, and we came up with what would become the Sack Lunch Project. I knew I would need somebody to co-chair and be willing to give a pretty fair amount of hands-on and ongoing effort. And I talked about it with Judy Ambra, who was then Beth Sharon president. And she just said, very confidently, you need to ask Vicki and Michael Richker. They'll do it. And she was right. I didn't know them, but I asked Vicki, and there was absolutely no hesitation. And they already had a pretty big schedule of commitments, but it was just, sure, of course. It has been such a pleasure working with you, Vicki. I really admire you and am continually amazed at your incredible ability to just get things done. And as a bonus, we now enjoy a real friendship that we probably would not have had otherwise. Speaking of sack lunches, my deepest thanks to Sisterhood for continuing to sponsor and subsidize our monthly project that we do on behalf of both Search and Kids Meals. My appreciation also to Jennifer Rosenzweig for promoting and supporting the project to Marco Alvarado and Eileen Pettigrew for your ongoing help with ordering and inventory, and to our facilities staff, especially John Houston and Jaime Rivera, who I know I can depend on to have everything set up, as well as help me out with all the heavy lifting. And a huge thanks to all of the SAC Lunch volunteers, past and present, for your participation in and commitment to this project. While I'm thanking people, I would like to acknowledge my family, to my husband Arnold, our wonderful kids, their equally wonderful spouses, and our amazing grandchildren. I love and I'm grateful for each and every one of you. A special thanks to my sister Cindy for taking on the fun task of introducing me, and to my daughter Leslie and my friend Andrea for volunteering as backups. To my parents, 
It is absolutely incredible to be able to share this day with you both. There's not much more I can add to that. But a special thanks to my dad, who up until COVID was one of our best and most dependable volunteers. And finally, and so meaningfully to me, I want to say a few words to and about the Stein family. As I said at first, Bethy Shuren has always been a part of my life. Well, so has the Stein family. They, along with the Dushkins, were our family's closest friends. I grew up with all of them. We got together all the time. As Cindy said, we called each other's parents, aunts, and uncles. And when I got the call from Linda Brandt about receiving this award, the first person I wanted to share it with, besides my mom, was Marcia Stein Schooler. So I grew up knowing Martha Lee when I was a child and a teenager. I remember her kind voice and her ready smile. I had some knowledge that she was busy and involved uh, at Beth Yashurin, and that she and Albert were uh, active and well-known in the community, and also a sense that she had a lot of friends. But I also got to know her as I became an adult, and I saw that her involvement, especially here at Beth Yashurin, was second nature. I think she saw her work for sisterhood in the synagogue as just part of being a member and her obligation as a Jewish woman. From my perspective, people loved being around her and working together with her, which it seems she enjoyed as well. On a personal note, I was always so proud that I had a close relationship with someone who was so highly thought of by everyone. Martha Lee left us a legacy of lifelong service and giving. For me, receiving this award named for her is beyond meaningful, and it is also an inspiration to do what I can to honor and live up to that legacy. And I'd also like to say something about Albert, because to me this award is also about him. He established it out of love and pride in Martha Lee, and every year as Sisterhood honored her memory at this event, it meant so much to him and his family, and honestly to all of us who knew her. So about Albert, when I first joined Beth Yashur in Social Action 20-something years ago, we were volunteering at the St. Joseph Food Pantry uh, in the 6th Ward near downtown. We delivered bags of groceries and bags of produce and other items to people's homes, and we visited with them for a bit. So Albert had been volunteering for a while when I joined, and he had his route that he you know, usually drove with another man. But there was one time, and I don't remember why, I got to drive his route with him. And I remember so clearly how he interacted with each person we saw. I, I mean, the people loved him. They lit up when they saw him. But what I saw was the way he related so easily and personally to each individual with kindness and interest in their lives and just friendship. It left a huge impression on me about how to treat people, everyone, and how to truly give of yourself. You know, it's just a wonderful memory that I have of Albert and a lesson that has definitely stayed with me. So again, my sincere gratitude to the Stein family and to our sisterhood for this wonderful honor. And to all of you who are here, in person, online, and in spirit, thank you very much. On behalf of, first of all, those were beautiful words, so I, I almost have to wipe my tears, but um, thank you so much. It really is beautiful. On behalf of Sisterhood, gift from our gift shop, but this is for you for all you do, so thank you. And now I would like to call up Michael Richker and Elizabeth Wasserman to say a few words about Vicki and introduce her. Okay, so as you know, I have the honor of being Vicki's daughter. Um, I want to thank you, Sisterhood and the Stein family, for honoring my mom and Marcia with this wonderful and very deserving honor. Sisterhood holds a very special place in my mom's heart. Energetic, passionate, compassionate, kind, smart, loving, generous, devoted, and beautiful inside and out are just a few words to describe my amazing mom. To know her is to love her. She gives everything she has to her family, friends, and community, and she does it with a warm smile and an open heart. Vicki wears many wonderful hats, best mom, grandma, mother-in-law, and aunt, an aunt in the world, trusted friend and confidant, and a leader, doer, organizer, 
and worker bee for causes and organizations near and dear to her heart. Sometimes I think there are two of her in order to get everything done on her lengthy to-do list. But she loves being busy, helping others is her purpose, her calling. It's her true passion, and she has an equally passionate, generous, and devoted partner working side by side with her every day, her wonderful husband, Michael, and they are quite the dynamic duo. They are involved in almost too many philanthropic organizations to mention, but I'll try to get them all out before they pull out the cane. In 2019, Vicki and Michael were awarded the Lamp Lightner Award at the Aishel House Annual Gala for their exemplary community service. They are avid volunteers and take great pleasure in delivering meals to patients at the medical center. They're active volunteers for Meals on Wheels and have served as chairs and co-chairs for various committees at the Evelyn Rubenstein Jewish Community Center. Vicki has co-chaired the Lion of Judah event for the Jewish Federation, and in 2011 and 2012, together with Michael, chaired the annual Super Sunday Phonathon. She served on Houston Advisory Council for Israel Bond, where she maintains an active role, served on the board of directors of Hebrew Free Loans of Houston, serves on the board of directors at Texas Medical Center Orchestra. She and Michael are gala raffle chairs for Seven Acres and have sponsored the annual Veterans Day program and concert since 2008. They've hosted, as, they've hosted and served as co-chairs for several programs and events at Jewish Family Services. Vicki and Michael were awarded Congregation Beth Assurance First Myrna E. Rudolph Tikkun Alam Award in 2010 for exemplifying Myrna's spirit and the true meaning of Tikkun Alam, giving unselfishly of their time, energy, and talents. Vicki is currently co-president of Beth Assurance Sisterhood with her dear friend Barbara Kozlov and chaired Sisterhood Shabbat and Torah Fun, and has co-chaired Sisterhood Shabbat and Torah Fun. Vicki serves on the board of directors at Beth Yashurin, co-chaired the membership committee, social action committee, and co-chaired the volunteers who participated in the renewal of Torah project, and has coordinated the assembly and mailing of annual High Holy Day admission tickets through the past several years. And I can attest to that, because every time I talk to her, she's like, wait, I gotta take this call. So she's always. Um, outside of the Jewish community, Vicki and Michael are actively involved with Houston Symphony, Stages Repertory Theater, AD Players, and Catholic Charities, distributing groceries weekly to those in need. As you can see, I'm extremely proud of my mom and of Michael. And Michael, would you like to say or add anything? <clears throat> wow, that was about my wife. <laughs> I can't believe all of that. <laughs> I want to say first, Yasha Koak to Marsha. <clears throat> All I can say about Marcia is peanut butter and jelly. <clears throat> I don't know if you know what that means, but we had the pleasure and the responsibility, and it was, and it was our uh, wonderful feelings that we could help others through the search project, through the social action committee, and we worked together with Marcia for years assembling the sandwiches and the, and the bags that were distributed daily on the day that we put them together in the hallway of Beth Yashurin for many years. And for that, we feel very worthwhile that we did so much for the community. Yasha Kowak again, Marcia. Uh, so she asked me, do I have anything else to say? Well. Uh, all I can say is, um, <clears throat> <clears throat> of all the girls I've known, and I've known some, until I first met you, I was lonesome. And when you came in sight, dear, my heart grew light. And this whole world seemed new to me. You're really swell, and I have to admit, you deserve expressions that really fit you. And so I've racked my brain, hoping to explain the many things that you do to me. 
By mere mist to shame, please let me explain. By mere mist to shame means that you're grand. By mere mist to shame, again I'll explain. It means you're the fairest in the land. I could say Bella, Bella, even say Wunderbar. Each language only helps me tell me how grand you are. I've tried to explain my beer, Mr. Shane. So kiss me and say that you'll be mine. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm glad I went before him because can't beat that. <laughs> so Michael, uh, okay, I already did that. So without further ado, my mom and best friend, Vicki Richker, recipient of the 2021 Martha Lee Stein Award of Achievement. Woman of Achievement Award. There <laughs> okay, after all that uh, introduction and uh, after all the wonderful words that my co-president here has said, my dear friend, my uh, co-chair for the last year and a half on every single sisterhood activity, but we, we got it going. My daughter was saying this morning, Mom, I said, no, I'd be nervous up to this point. Now today, it's her turn to be nervous, and she has been. Anyway, uh, everything has been said, all the thank yous, and I go along with everything. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, we came to Houston in 1967, came with uh, my husband then, and uh, a little baby, four months old, Elizabeth. Uh, we were living in Bracefield Apartments, and that was job, and had my and went to the swimming pool. We met this very nice man talking, talking, and after a while we said, what do you do? He says, uh, I'm a rabbi. I said, oh, okay. Uh, where? No, oh, we have a congregation, Beth Yishern, wonderful. That was Rabbi Jack Siegel. And that's how we came to congregation Beth Yishern. I joined Sisterhood before I even joined the congregation. It's been a wonderful, I'm not a speech writer, I'm a doer. You tell me to do something, I do. This is my speech. <laughs> so, and I don't wanna bore anybody with a long speech, but everything has been said. Marsha, it's been wonderful working with you. Congratulations. We have developed a wonderful friendship and uh, it is an honor to share this award with you and with all the past recipients. I feel very honored to be here today. Uh, I don't take honoring too well. Tell me to do something, I'll do, or we'll work it out. Uh, Barbara, it's been an amazing almost four years. We should have not been four years president. So now, really what I want to say, step up, we need young blood, we need new ideas, and we'll be right there with you all. So if you're watching us online, or if you're here, say, hey, I want to uh, get involved in sisterhood and take over. Uh, we love sisterhood. Sisterhood has been amazing. I feel we do wonderful things. I love Beth Yesherin. At one time, uh, people have said, do you all have a room here? Because you and Michael are here all the time. Do you sleep here? I said, yes, the class is over there. You know, that's, that's where we are. Uh, we are very active with the um, chapel. In, 
18 years, it's been 18 years that Michael and I found each other in the chapel. And uh, Beth Yushan has been one of our most important jobs that we do. We love it. And uh, I'm really not going to say much more because all the thank yous that go, we have an amazing clergy, we have an amazing staff, our kitchen people are fantastic. They, uh, we all work together so wonderfully. We're very lucky to be at Beth Yushan and to have the sisterhood that we have. And uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody because uh, everybody has really made a wonderful experience for me. Thank you to my family. One more thing, my biggest accomplishment has really been my grandchildren. I have taken, I say I take, but I really don't take them. I go along with uh, their parents to take my grandchildren to college. And that's, that they allowed me actually to go. But uh, as you know, I'm a doer and uh, I say, okay, let's get the room, get it going. And my daughter and my son say, mom, enough, we'll finish tomorrow. No, we're finishing now. So that has been one of my biggest pleasures and uh, my biggest accomplishment, my children, my grandchildren, and to my husband, thank you for being there. Actually, Michael at one time was um, a member of Sisterhood. You pay dues, you know, you do that. I don't know where we went. So without him, uh, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. Thank you again. And one more thing, the biggest thank you goes to Hashem for giving me the strength to be able to do all the mitzvot. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. And Michael, I know what our program for next year's Torah Fund is going to be, so start working on it. Anyway, thank you again. Both of y'all are wonderful. Now, it is my honor to do, introduce our guest speaker, Ellen Leventhal. Um, she um, was a teacher at Schlenker. She is a children's book writer, and she has brought some of her books to share with us. But she's going to talk about her experiences and her books. And I hope you'll give her a big welcome to Bethy Shuren's Sister Torfan program. This will even make it here. Um, will it sit? Yeah. I don't know. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm, even though I belong to Beth Israel, I've spent a lot of time at Beth Yasharan over the years. Bar mitzvahs, weddings, all kinds of fun things. First of all, uh, mazel tov again to Marsha and Vicki. You guys are amazing, and this is such a well-deserved honor. Whoops. So when Barbara called me up and asked me to do this, I assumed that she has a list of people on her phone named Ellen, and she hit the wrong button. Because I was like, why? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm happy I, I would be there for anything. Then when she told me Marsha won the award, um, as one of my dearest friends, I thought, well, I would go anyway, so I will try to have some fun and talk to you a little bit. As Barbara said, I'm not a native Houstonian. We moved here from Pittsburgh. Um, I've lived here 38 years, which is longer than I've lived any other place. I moved here in 1983, and I clearly remember schlepping a baby and an almost four-year-old and everything that entails. We get off the plane and we're in the airport and I hear this buzzing about talking about Alicia. Alicia's gonna come, Alicia's gonna hit. And I'm like, who is this Alicia? Do I wanna see her? <laughs> I kind of forgot about that. So we get in the car and, well, of course I walk out of the airport and my glasses completely 
fog up like, you know, we're used to now, and especially with our masks. And we get on the highway. I don't know if it was 59 or 45. Now, Pittsburgh, I, I, I from New Jersey, lived in D.C. Anyway, and Pittsburgh's where we were last. Have these beautiful rolling hills. And we're on either 45 or 59, I don't remember. We're driving down the road, and in front of me is a pickup with a gun rack. <laughs> so right away, I'm like trying to take care of my babies in the back seat, like, oh my God. So then, not only was it a gun rack, there was, do you know the, the radio station KIK, K-I-K-K? Okay, well, the, the K's to me looked like L's. And it said, proud to be a kicker, but I read it as, proud to be a killer. You brought me to this place where these people are proud to be killers. And my husband said, those of you who know him, he's just like, okay, settle down. Those are not L's, those are K's. And I lost it. I said, you brought me to a place where it says they're proud to be in the KKK? I was like, I just wanted to turn around. But we did, we stayed at a hotel for a day or two and we moved into our house and I met Alicia. <laughs> she was not what I thought she would be. <laughs> so here we are knowing nobody. My husband did know some people because we were transferred down here with um, Gulf Oil and they all the same people went to work every day. Nothing much changed for him. I knew no one. Our fences down, it, it was just a mess. But when people told me, I'm listening to remember the little transistor radios because you don't have power or whatever, and it said, <laughs> it said to tape your windows. Well, I had this crib for my now almost 40 year old. And I pulled that away, from, I knew enough to pull it away from the window, right? And then I took scotch tape, <laughs> taped it taped my window. So there was definitely some culture shock when I moved here, <laughs> but it didn't take long for us to really feel that Houston was home. My friends up north were saying, number one, you'll never meet a Jew there. There are no Jews in Texas. In the whole of Texas, there are no Jews. <laughs> and then, even when I moved here with people from Gulf, they said, you'll never meet a native Houstonian. Happily, Jews and native Houstonians abounded, including my friend Marsha. Uh, Marsha, I don't remember if we met at the camp corner, or I remember when you were pregnant with Leslie at the camp corner, or if it was at JCC Sports when you guys were doing what you do. <laughs> but it's been a long time, and I'm so proud of you. Anyway, um, I've always been a teacher, and I, even though I'm not, teaching, teaching right now, I'm tutoring, I will always be a teacher. And I think that's first and foremost. I taught special ed in DC and in Pittsburgh. And then down here, um, I worked for a few schools and Schlenker was the one I worked at the longest with Cheryl and Peggy. Peggy and I, Peggy Portnoy back there, were partners our last few years. And I loved it. And people said, well, how did you get into writing? Well, I was always writing. I was a shy kid who wouldn't talk, but I would write poems that made no sense at all. But, you know, I was little, they were cute. And then I was the angst-filled teenager who would go to, there was a rock in a park that I had to sit there and just write about my angst-filled life, which of course was not a bad life, but you know, I was 14. Um, when I was here, I taught at Schlenker for a really long time, 18 years full time, and then about 12 years part time, very part time. And I always loved writing. I loved teaching writing. I would rewrite the curriculum. Sorry, Cheryl, but I did. <laughs> to make, I remember one time it was a rock cycle rap because the science book was really boring. And so I did a lot of that. Um, I wrote the dialogue for the annual musical sometimes. And teaching and writing were always enmeshed. 
and I, that's how I still think of myself now. Um, but every year I would go to the JCC Book Fair and think, I could do that, I could do that, I could do that. The problem was I didn't try hard enough back then to do it. And the other problem was, is no, I could not do that. <laughs> I had no idea the work that went behind writing a 500 word picture book. Most of these books you see that look well, like this one, um, this one, proceeds going to the Torah Fund, um, take years. And it, it seems crazy, but it's true. But the first way I got into it, my friend Ellen Rothberg and I entered a contest many years ago. And some of you know the book Donate the Blue Bonnets. We won on that book. But we, we got into the finals, and the publisher really liked us and kept asking us to revise. So she'd say, oh, this is really, really good, but fix it. So we would fix it. We would, as I teach my kids when I write for revision, we take words out, put words in, turn words around, look at it again. So when I do school visits and I show the kids some of my revisions, it took about 25 times after it was, it was accepted. Anyway, we won. Apparently, there were, you could vote, and there was this thing called Facebook that I had never heard of at the time. And so um, kids who had it kind of set it around and voted for us. After that, I was hooked. I was really lucky. I got to write and go into schools and teach full time. It got to be a little bit much, but um, you know that's just kind of what it was, and that's why I left teaching full time because I didn't think I could do both jobs the way I really wanted to do it. Um, after the the publisher went out of business, who did uh, the first version of Donate the Blue Bonnets and some other books. They didn't go out of business, they just decided they didn't want to do um, what's called kid lit you know, anymore, especially picture books, because it takes a long time and it's, it's much more expensive. Excuse me, I had some dental work and I'm <laughs> having a hard time speaking. Um, it's much more expensive to uh, produce a picture book than any other type of book. Anyway, at that point, we didn't know what to do with the Blue Bonnet book. Another publisher, small publisher in Abilene, heard of it and picked it up. And then I wrote, um, what was it, Lola Can't Leap with that publisher also. But it took a long time, but I finally sort of, kinda, made it to the big time with this book. And all that means is that the publisher was bigger, could give a bigger advance, or could give an advance at all, and that they had a marketing group. The first books, I, there was no marketing unless I did it. So I have a long way to go, but I, I'm getting there. Um, I kept thinking I wasn't going to keep doing this. I'm really old now, and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? You know, my next book, I'll be, it's not really all, but I'll be 72 when my next one comes out. And so there's a group of us on Facebook, and we started this group years ago. Um, have you heard of the Caldecott Medal? Leslie, I know you have. <laughs> the Newberry. Newberry's for writing. Caldecott is for uh, illustrating. And even though none of us are illustrators, we came up with the name the Caldecoots. So we're like the old coots of the publishing industry because the editors are like 10. I, they're, they're so young. They're like, yeah, you know, my, I, it was really fun when um, I was in that sorority two years ago. OK. So it's, it's a very different world. And it, there is, like anything, there is a little bit of ageism in there. So it's harder for us if they know you. But when this book was published, um, I did get an agent, and somehow my age came up. And she's like, oh, that's amazing. You don't sound that old. I was like, you've only read a book for an eight-year-old. So no, I don't. But anyway, um, a lot of people say, well, what do you do all day? What's your writing routine? And I don't really have too much of a routine. Um, but basically, I 
revise a lot. I'm a serial reviser, as Peggy knows. <laughs> I, when we used to, to do speeches for fifth grade graduation, Peggy would have to put up with me revising it as we were walking down. <laughs> so I revise a lot. Um, I do marketing, which I absolutely hate if I'm marketing my own book. It's so hard. Um, you know, I'm just like, Ugh, don't look at me. Don't, th it was just, it was hard. I love marketing other people's books. Um, I spend my days submitting to agents or publishing houses and gathering a lot, a lot of rejections. So if you want to write and rejections are going to like kill you to the core, don't. It took me a long time to know it's not personal. But, you know, it's like every other day you'd get, Dear Ms. Leventhal, thank you for, for submitting your lovely picture book to me. I really enjoyed reading it. However, it's not for my list. I mean, you know them by heart. I could paper my, do wallpaper my wall. My problem is that I revise so much, I kind of revise, I've known, been known to revise the heart out of a story because I'm in four different critique groups. Who do you believe? You know, this person says one thing, that says someone else. So that's the other thing that's difficult for me and for a lot of people to know you need to stick to your story. Yes, you're going to change it based on if somebody says, oh, you know, I didn't get this and there's a hole here or what if you do this? Then you have to think about it and make a decision. And that's hard for me because I still always think, oh, if so-and-so said that, that must be better than mine. Or if so-and-so said that, it has to be better than mine. Um, I'm working on it. It's kind of hard. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what some of my um, colleagues, my writing friends, call writing while Jewish. Um, there's a big push for diversity right now in children's literature, which there should be, and I am 100% on board with that. However, Jewish content and Jewish writers are not in that, not considered diverse enough to get some of the perks that diverse writers get. When I say perks, it doesn't mean they get their books published, but it does mean that one editor might say, I'm looking for diverse writers or diverse content. And if Jewish content was something that was considered diverse, I would have more, if I were writing a Jewish content book, I'd have more, um, more of an entree onto this author's, um, you know, onto her list. We're also, this group and I were at, the group has gotten bigger, it started with just four. We're working on Jewish representation. If you look at some children's books, if there is Jewish representation, it's often very stereotypical. I was at one of my son's house and somebody brought his kids a book on Hanukkah. It was, awful. And it was published, and a, I, I don't think it was a PJ Library one, but it was published by a pretty good publisher. The, first of all, the facts were wrong. <laughs> I was like, this is not true. And um, the parents were drawn offensively, very stereotypically offensively. The kids' names were Miriam and David, and David had curly hair, and Miriam was, it, it was just, it was terrible. So that's just one thing, but there's another big problem um, right now, and it, it started mostly probably in the summer and spring during the whole Gaza issues. Um, the general publishers, not the Jewish publishers, are often afraid to write anything that has, to publish anything that has Israel mentioned. I mean, mentioned. Um, there was a lot of pushback. I don't remember the name of one book didn't get published because it was something about Israel. 
there's a book out now. It's a, a YA, a young adult book called Once More with Chutzpah. And it's gotten really good reviews, but it's gotten a lot of one-star, really bad reviews on Goodreads. And reviews are really important. So here's one of the reviews it got. Oh, oh I didn't even tell you. Once more with Chutzpah takes place um, on a birthright trip. And it isn't about Israel. It certainly is not political. They happen to meet, and it's this group of kids. And they really, they're, they're examining um, their Judaism, but they're examining their sexuality. They're talking about their friendships. It's a great YA book. OK, so here's one of the reviews. Yes, I love to read some road trip in Israel why thousands of people are being targeted for religious hate crimes and having to flee their home country because they fear for their lives. Perfect book. That got a one star. I mean, obviously, that person gave them one star. Another one, no thank you. In this house, we do not support books passed off as fun romps through an apartheid settler state routinely, that, that routinely murders and displaces and subjugates Palestinians. Okay, here's the thing about that. That book had not even been published yet. You can write a Goodreads review if you've gotten a copy of the book. It's usually from the publisher. And that's good. You want them. You don't want them. And I know that they didn't get reviews, you know, get them from the publishers. One of these people I know because she's been doing a lot of other things. So there was some, some type of um, the anti-Israel sentiment went into anti-Semitism for a little bit. I think it's getting better. So writing while Jewish, it, it can be tricky. But a lot, there's this, this group, I'm in so many different writing groups, I don't know which is which. There's one group of um, Jewish marketers called the, the Book Meshuganas. I'm actually not in that yet. Um, it turns out that even if I'm not writing Jewish content, or my other friends who are Jewish are not writing Jewish content, like all of our backgrounds, our Judaism somehow seeps into it. Even if they're funny books, because often it's the values. OK, so when I wrote this book that I'll talk about in a minute, because many, many of you can relate to the reason I wrote this, um, I didn't think about it as a Jewish book, but I've presented it to a Jewish day school, and I thought, I'm going to focus on the Jewish values in this book. And so those, they came out. I didn't, I didn't think, ooh, Jewish values, I want to write. But the book is about caring and kindness and definitely community. And those are all Jewish values. So when I'm in a Jewish day school, I can actually say, you know, chesed, kehila, tikkun olam. And I realized that it just kind of comes out. Now, just to tell you a little bit about this book, many of you can relate to it. I, along with many of you in this room, have been was a part of the three-time Floody Club. Yay! You know. <laughs> and after Memorial Day, I walked outside, and you know, my house, I lost pretty much everything. And I immediately thought the, of all the other people who maybe didn't have a place to go or, um, you know, who were worse off than us. But I, um, I thought about Hillel, you know, because I thought, well, what can I do? So I really thought, you know, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? So my husband and I were kind of on the, if I'm only for myself, what am I? Because we had a hard time accepting help. Um, but we did it when somebody told me, you know, accepting that help is a mitzvah. And they were like, oh, OK, that's all right then. Then I can take stuff from all my friends, which I just felt like I was doing a lot. 
But more than Hillel, Mr. Rogers <laughs> kind of helped me because he said, look for the helpers. And those of us who've gone through this know that there were so many helpers. And I look around here and I see some of my helpers. Um, again, thank you, Marcia <laughs> and Arnold. And actually so many people. Um, but people asked if I would write a kid's book for the, yes, we missed you on our street, um, if I would write a kid's book about the flood. And I couldn't. I just, I was writing, I was writing blog posts and essays and all kinds of things and really focusing on the fact that it wasn't just me, it wasn't just you, or just you, it was a whole community. So um, I just couldn't find, but I couldn't find the nugget in writing for kids. Maybe I just wasn't ready to do it. And then, of course, came tax day. <laughs> Moved out for a little bit, came back in. And then we all know what happened in 2017. It was, Harvey was much worse than Alicia to me. <laughs> but um, that's when I realized that I fe could find the nugget that I wanted to write about that was in front of me from the day I walked out of my house after the Memorial Day flood, that I needed to write about kindness and helping. I did not want to write a book. The kids were, had enough. You know, I didn't really want to write a book about, oh, poor you, how are you going to do this? So this book does acknowledge the difficulty and the anger that this child was feeling. I was lucky enough to be teaching at the time, and I was teaching part-time at Schlenker, and I just had a few kids in each group. Every single group, either somebody was living in somebody else's house, or they were living in, it was just, they've all, everyone was touched by Harvey. And I talked to them, and I was saying how, we were talking about what made you feel better, and I said what made me feel better was that I still had the ability to help other people, if only that meant um, commiserating with someone in the high bank, you know, but, you know, that we were there for each other. Again, it was a community, even after the flood. And so these little kids actually said, oh yeah, you know, I drew a picture for my sister and she felt better or I helped mom find a new toy because my brother's toy got flooded. So that's what this is about. And um, I've written several, so writing, writing while Jewish, I had all those Jewish values that were just inside me, finding out it was inside all of us. And again, it was all about a community. We went through this together. And um, so this book, the first line is, when the river jumped its banks, everything changed. Well, of course, I couldn't say bio. I want people to, outside of Houston to buy the book, you know? But we also, I have no, I don't speak to the illustrator. I don't know the illustrator. We have no idea what's going on. The, the editor and the publisher, or the editor will be the go-between between, between the author and the illustrator. And I think it's because some authors want to be bossy and say, oh no, that's not what I thought of, that's not what she looks like. A picture book is 50-50. I did know they wanted to make it diverse. And when it came out, my main character is interracial. And I had no idea, and it looks great now. Only thing, there are lots of crowd pictures that they made very diverse. Um, but there's no kippah or Jewish star or anything. And again, it wasn't anything that the illustrator did or didn't think of, but we as Jewish writers, these groups that I'm in, want to educate people that, yes, it's harder to make a Jewish person look diverse. I mean, you know, you walk down the street, you might not know you're Jewish, but there are books. If you have any time and you're, with, you're reading picture books to your grandkids, um, check them out. There are books now that are starting where it's just called, um, 
It's just the representation in the book without having anything to do with the religion. Here's a, there's a great book called We Don't Eat Our Classmates. <laughs> do you know that one? It's great. It's really, really funny. It's about dinosaurs going to school and didn't realize there'd be kids and they want to eat them. But one of the classroom room scenes, a little boy has a kippah on. It's not, there's no attention drawn to it. It's just he's part of that diverse mix, which is really kind of cool. Um, I've written several Jewish content books over the years. None have been published <laughs> until now. Um, it's not published yet, but my next book is, um, again, this is a Houston book in some ways, and the next book is too. It's, it's called Debbie's Song, and it's the life of Debbie Friedman. And many of you know that Debbie has a huge Houston connection and that she was actually at Beth Yashurin for a while. Uh, she was at Beth Israel. During my research, I got to interview a lot of people. Rabbi Karf, before he passed away, he and I spoke a lot because he knew her very well. So that's coming out, and that's really my first kind of Jewish content book, and it's going to be published by um, Carben, if you know Jewish kids' books. And um, really, the only thing else I wanna to end on, instead of saying, oh yeah, you know, it's hard to get Jewish representation and there's anti-Semitism, all that's true, but I wouldn't give this up for anything. But my favorite thing to do is to go into schools and um, present to kids and get to interact with kids. And um, luckily, I've had years as a teacher and when they start to misbehave, I usually can handle it. So I just wanna tell you a few things. One time, I did a presentation, the teachers left, I'm packing up, and these kids are coming back into the room. I have no idea what's going on. They're running around. I decided it was my job to get them to stop running around, and I'm playing Simon Says with them. It was after school care, and the after school teacher was late, so I had them for a half hour. Um, Another time, I was in El Paso, it was all Spanish speaking. One little, it was pre-K, one started to cry. I could have used you then. <laughs> and they're speaking Spanish, and then I heard mi madre, and then they're crying. Then the entire, entire pre-K class is crying. I had no idea what to do. And um, so I was picking up some, some words, and uh, it got better, but it, it was tough. But here's my very favorite one, and then I'm done. <laughs> uh, this was in Houston. It was in Spring Branch the day before winter break. So you can imagine what the kids are like anyway, right? It's in this big room, and there's a divider. Oh, and it was pajama day. So the kids are coming in. The teachers are not with them yet. I must, they must have said, go, go in and sit down. So I have all these kids coming in in their pajamas and the other side, and the divider wasn't all the way down, it was about halfway. Santa was there. <laughs> now, how am I going to um, do this? They're like, they're Santa Claus. I, I can't, you know, I can't, um, com um, can't even think of the word. It was, it was crazy. So there they are, day before school. Santa's there. They're in pajamas. They are wild. No teachers yet. So this one kid, I hear them arguing. This one little girl is saying, that's not really Santa. Santa's not, re that's not real, that's not real Santa. And then this poor little boy, yes it is, that's Santa. He's about to cry, right? And, and then all I hear is ho, ho, ho from the other side. <laughs> And no teachers yet. And they're going back and forth. And so one kid comes up and goes, Miss, Miss, is Santa real? I'm like, oh my God, I'm in this room with a few hundred kids in their pajamas with Santa, and, and they brought in a real deer and called it a reindeer. Next, kind of on the other side. Thank 
goodness, they finished it. And she, little girl said, I just said that's not Santa. The real one's at the mall. <laughs> just like, <laughs> So anyway, you just never know what's going to happen. And um, I'm not going to do anything here. I just wanted to show you because people do think, oh, picture book. This is my research and my re some, some revisions of the Debbie Friedman book. And um, so it takes a while. But anyway, thank you. And uh, Mazel Tov again, Marsha and Vicki. Thank, thank you. you so much. You did great. <laughs> I thank you, Ellen. She, I called and asked, and she said, okay, and I couldn't be happier. So thank you for joining thank us. And this is from, I'll carry it for you if you want, but this is from Sister for You. Oh, thank and you. And again, she does have some of her books out, will be out on the table if you want to get some. And again, I appreciate you taking the time and telling us about your writing career. So thank you. And now, yeah, I probably should have held up. So now we're going to, those of you who are staying for lunch, we're going to move into Stein Hall and we're going to have lunch. Um, uh, Ellen will be outside selling her book or you can order a book because she doesn't have that many with her, but you can order if you want. I have your pens if you are a guardian or benefactor, so please come see me and join us in Stein Hall and Cantor Finkelstein, I believe, will be in there and lead us in the Hamotzi. Thank you all for joining us. It's a wonderful event and um, have a great day. Thank you.